Welcome to the Second Line Show. I'm Nolan Ash. Let's let the good Awesome. Once again, welcome to the Second Line Show. I'm your host, Nolan Nash, and I have got a thrilling show for you today with some <laughs> fabulous thriller authors. And of course, the one, the only, Annie McDonald is joining us today. So feel free to send some love to Annie. You know we love her. Um, to introduce our authors to you today, make sure you're leaving comments and questions for all of us as we go along. We have Miss Rhea Fry, Vanessa Lilly, who just launched a book yesterday, and Mr. Robert Dugoni. We're going to get to know these guys a little bit better here in just a moment. Wave at everybody, guys. Hey, there. We're going to start this show off um, the way that we love to do with Annie and her. Oh, okay. Annie McDonald, take it away, my love. All right. Hi, everybody. So, you know, I want to recommend just a couple of books to y'all that I uh, think y'all need to check out. Well, of course, the first three are going to be The Reason We're Here. Nice choice. Yeah, great choices. So, um, of course, I asked them for an interview and Nola lovingly uh, has them joining us. So we're going to learn more about their books. So I'm not even going to waste your time. But also the others that I think are wonderful are The Brilliant Life of Eudora Honeyset, which came out yesterday by Annie Lyons. Mm -hmm. She, um, this book is so cute. It's an 85 year old woman who's ready to go off to Switzerland to give up her life. She believes that she's ready for death until she meets a young, a young child who, who sets her on a new path, which I just think is beautiful. Then um, older, by Pamela Redmond. I don't know if any of y'all know Younger, the Net TV Land um, mm -hmm. Netflix mm -hmm. show. So Older has uh -huh. just came out yesterday by Pamela Redmond. It's the second half of Younger. Mm -hmm. And um, it just was released yesterday. And <laughs> I'm on the Jane Austen Society of India. Wow. At 12 o'clock on Saturday, speaking with the wonderful Sunya Guntor and her, Sunya, I'm sorry, Guntor and her, Pamela Redford, on Saturday at noon, discussing older. So, um, and also, last but not least, when we were young and brave is the pre-order I recommend right now. Everybody knows this is about the Japanese occupation in World War II, but mm -hmm. over in China and how we're, uh, Britain... Yeah. British family is affected. So back to you, Nola. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annie, for that. And look, everybody's loving your hair. They love you. It's so good to oh, see thanks. you, sweetheart. We are so glad that you are here. Thank, um, you. thank you. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and taking um, this time out of your busy schedules, especially with all you've got going on right now. And just joining us to have some fun. So I'm gonna let you guys introduce yourselves kind of one at a time, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your book. And then we're going to talk about researching for thrillers. And I know some of you have done some pretty interesting research. I would imagine all of you have, and Vanessa, just watching and kind of trolling your posts a little bit on a novel, a novel B, I was able to see some of the things that you were actually researching from back alleys and fun things like that. So I know you guys have got some great stories to tell, but first at least let everybody know who you are and a little bit about the books that you've got out. Um, Rhea, we're gonna start with you since you are right next to me. Excellent. So my name is Rhea Fry, and thank you, Nola, for not butchering it. Everyone calls me Great Play. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I am a multi-published domestic suspense author with St. Martin's Press. And my latest book, Until I Find You, just came out August 11th. Um, this book is about a blind widow, Rebecca Gray, who believes her three-month-old son, Jackson, has been swapped for another baby but no one will believe her. So super light comedy. Um, <laughs> I really love writing about things that just scare the crap out of mothers. Uh, that's like my MO. I love kind of driving deep into to issues between 
mothers and children. Uh, but this one was really research heavy and super interesting to write. Like I, I recommend every writer write from a blind woman's perspective mm. when take away sight, which is what we rely on as writers mm -hmm. uh, is so challenging. Uh, wow. So that is a That's amazing. awesome thing. And I, I, I know some of the things that you got to do to research for this. So I can't wait to hear about some of those oh, things. Um, Vanessa, we're going to go on to you. I feel like oh. I need to be the inner, I want to interject for both sure. of the authors because so what I love so much about her story as an author is that she, this is, you, if you follow Ray on social media, you will know this, which is like, she's such a driven person. She's got great goals. She's very honest about the writing journey. Um, I love her Instagram. I follow her podcast. I'm like a super fan. Also, I have the same situation for Robert. So you're not off the hook. <laughs> it's all the way there. So but what I love about her story, and both of these authors have great stories, is that she has she's had all these like very interesting, cool jobs of like um, like a branding place in Chicago and like a like interesting places, but she like basically locked in on wanting to be an author, had this incredible concept for her debut wrote it sold it for like four, a four book deal like just completely had a dream and like achieved it and i think that is so admirable in this industry that you just knew what you wanted to do and you just went after it because i think fear is what keeps a lot of us back and you I agree. overcame it and you did it and i think that is the coolest thing Thank you. Robert yeah. did the same thing. What's happening? Robert oh, I'm did the same there. thing. Oh, I'm going to get there. Yeah. Up, same <laughs> thing. That's right. Because for Robert, so I saw him speak at Thriller. So we have the same publisher. And at this moment, we happen to have the same editor because my editor is on maternity leave. So Gracie mm -hmm. is my editor right now, too. But um, so I saw him at Thriller Fest right when I first signed with Thomas and Mercer. And he was talking about um, his like journey as an author. And it's it is so good that she took a leap of faith. I totally agree. Um, which is, it's like, because so much of this business is luck, which is yep. crazy. Like you would think it's talent, but it's not. Um, probably most authors published are very talented. Um, and like, so Robert was in the big five world for a little while and just for, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, but like just for different circumstances, it just, nothing hit. The books were great. Editors were behind you, everything. It just nothing hit. And then he went over to Thomas and Mercer, our publisher. And I mean to tell you, this gentleman here sells millions of books. Okay. Oh, he is a rock star. Do you have classes, Robert? <laughs> His books are phenomenal. They're so good. If you haven't read them, just get wait. You've got like nine, ten. Well, how many is in your series now? You've, you've got a lot of books ahead of you. It's so good. And he absolutely is one of the leaders in the, yeah, yeah, the last agent just came out, it's so good. Um, and so both of you guys like really um, maybe had some setbacks professionally, personally, whatever, but you were like, you know what? I know I have a gift. I know I can do it. And you did it and it's incredible. Well, Vanessa Millie <laughs> did the same thing. <laughs> yep. What about your story? You know, like, who's going to stand up for Vanessa here? Like she, <laughs> you're like the Caribbean too, because you know you had the same dream and you made it happen. But you also make it happy and by what happen, by what you're doing now. Yeah, you're, like I, you're the biggest author champion of the century. My yeah, God, but, you know I tried to be published for almost 13 years. By the time my debut is out, like this is a hard business and you fail a lot. And if you love it and you care about it then that's what matters. The journey is what it is. And I'm going to say, oh my God, oh my God. So oh, good. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it. But I just think that anyone who has a dream or even a dream of writing a book or any dream, like just know that it's not perfect the first time. It's not perfect the 10th time. Like you just, you keep at it. Yeah, I feel like people say, oh, I want to be published and that it's, they look at us and are like, or people that are published and think it's just this easy, joyful, amazing ride full of rainbows and sunshine. And it's not, I mean, I built a business around it, around 
helping authors figure out their path to publication. Because that's the cool thing about living today is you can be published. It's just picking which route is right for you, whether that's self-publishing, traditional, hybrid, and just mm-hmm. the business. That's what I'm the most passionate about because we get so in the clouds about this that we don't realize it's a business and your book's a product yeah. as well. And you know, I'm not selling millions of copies like Robert. I would love to hear your <laughs> experience around that. And that's the true dream. But <laughs> you brought some sort of business sense to that. And Nola, she's Hi. another fantastic author. Yay. <laughs> that um, has also worked very hard. And, uh, you know, I fell in love with your work just as everybody's here, you know. um, Thank you. And again, you're another author that champions other authors, which is wonderful. So Mm -hmm. everybody. I I mean, has anybody ever really truly met an overnight success? No, no, I I, I haven't. I've been doing this. I've been doing this for about 20 years and I have not met an overnight success. I think everybody everybody goes through their trials and tribulations and and you know it's it's sort of what you said vanessa it's it's staying with it um Mm -hmm. you know it's staying with it it's having belief in what you do that you do it well and there's so much that's outside of your control in this business there really is i mean you can write a great book but if it's not promoted correctly if they don't if they don't push it you know it's not going to get in people's hands and and that I really think that that success in this is is preparation and an opportunity. Yeah. When you get that opportunity, you're prepared for it, and you you put a good yeah. book out in somebody's hands, and they take it and they run with it. Um, you asked uh, Nola. You asked earlier. You know who who we are. Well, I mean, I think I, I'm I'm very flattered by what everybody has said, and thank you all very much. Um, but you know, like like everybody else, you know, I I started out in this business. Um, on highs and, and fell very low and then back up and then down and then up and then down. And, um, you know, I found, uh, I kind of found my pacing at, uh, at, at Thomas and Mercer and, um, you know, things took off and, uh, the book I got coming out on September 22nd, uh, which Annie has been kind enough to show because I wasn't smart enough to bring one with me. <laughs> uh, the last agent is, is the second in a series. And um, it's a book I never thought I would write. I mean, I had never in a million years that I think I was going to write a series where I had Charles Jenkins as the Death lead. Story. But <laughs> things, things happen, and we have, as writers, we have to be open to the stories that fall in our laps. I remember mm-hmm. years ago, um, I talked to Kristen Hanna about mm-hmm. the Nightingale, and I said to her, where did you get that story? And that's what she said to me. She said, sometimes stories fall in our laps, and we just need to get out of the way. And the eighth sister, which is the first story in the Charles Jenkins series, is a story that fell in my lap. And uh, I was blessed to have a, a, a publishing company and an editor that was open to the story that I wanted to write. And um, and, and that's, you know, kind of it, the, the eighth sister did really well and it led to a series. So, um, you know, we just have to be we have to be open and, and, and you know, um, willing to at least, you know, see that that what story is out there. I love that you mentioned the ups and downs because I I think that that's something that people don't realize can happen to an author too. They think that once you've been published, you're just kind of on a constant rise after that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that people really understand that sometimes that happens and sometimes there's, you know, there's this kind of rise and fall to a writing career and, it takes a whole lot of work to keep those, those, you know, the rise and fall from being the end, you know, to actually get back up and keep doing that so that, you know, that, that is not the end of everything that it is truly an ebb and flow. And people just don't understand. It's kind of the same thing. Like when people, you know, I published my book and all of my teacher friends at school are, so are you going to quit? <laughs> no. <laughs> You have a very warped sense of how this works. I mean, I love you. Thank you for your support, but no, I'm I don't want a lottery. I published a book. You know, I mean, it's it's a very people don't always understand Hmm? how the author's life truly works and how the careers actually work. The business works, and like we have said, I mean, it, it it is a business, and it takes a whole lot of of nurturing that business and that career to keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. 
that and absolutely more than authors i think being a debut the power of that is that you learn how much you don't know right and i'm grateful for that gift of knowing how ridiculous i was i, I mean so my, my book just came out yesterday so i'm not an expert on literally anything Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. at least not yes on another planet of existence which is where i felt when i was debuting because you just don't know and the things you're talking about that people's perceptions of what an author goes through they have those perceptions in them too because you sort of live with that expectation i think mm -hmm. or hope for it and you know it can be a little bit tricky but it's a gift to be outside of it and sort of see that it's not about whatever you imagine it's actually truly about the writing and connecting with people and the journey itself but it takes a minute connecting with people is fun i like that part and i think you know that's that's really you know you can say that you do it for the glory and riches and you hope one day, you know, it's going to be this big, huge thing. But honestly, the part that really brings me joy, and I know a lot of authors have said the same thing, is actually hearing from the writers, from the readers and saying, you know, I loved your work. I loved what you did here. That was you know, so much fun to read because truly when we sat down to write it, that's what it was all about. It was we had a story inside that needed to come out and, and to be on the page because it just was, you know, it was niggling at us. It wasn't going to let us go. It was part of who we are. And we've put it out there for the world. And so you really enjoy interacting with the readers because that's why you wrote the story. You wrote the story for them. It, it wasn't a career move at the time. You know, very few authors go into this and say, I'm going to make a career out of this. I'm going to write whatever's going to sell. No, well, Ste Stephen King called it telepathy, which I, if you haven't read his book on writing, I highly recommend it because what, what he yeah. calls tele telepathy and what Diana Gabaldon calls magic are really the two same things. And, you know, what Stephen King talked about is how does a writer sitting at his or her desk connect on an emotional level, on an empathetic level with a reader he's never met and never will meet? living in a city or a state or wherever that he's never visited and never will visit. And yet somehow the words on the page will bring that reader to tears or laughter or joy or sadness, whatever it is. And when you, when, when you think about it in those terms, um, like I said, Diana Gabaldon called it the magic. It, it's, really, um, it's really a very humbling profession because you begin to realize, at least I did, I began to realize that... Um, you know, what I was doing was I was telling stories that was, were having some emotional impact on the people that were reading them. And I think you, you begin to realize that you have, a, you have a commitment to the readers that are out there that the, the story you're going to write is going to be the best story that you can write and that it's going to be something that is going to emotionally move them. I think that's very true. That, that's it's an amazing way to look at it. It's a very humbling way to look at it. Um, Vanessa, oh, go ahead, Ria. I don't know. I was just going to say it's so interesting, though, like how we can connect with our readers. But when you are on deadlines and when you have expectations, you sometimes move so fast through those, or you'll only really tune into the negative reviews, or you won't just sit with those successes while they're happening because everything is moving so fast. And I wonder if anybody else struggles. Who cares about the reviews? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I read everything, but I actually love the negative reviews because it. That's what I mean. Who cares about the negative ones? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I learned very early on no one's going to universally love your work, no one's going to universally hate it. And that's kind of very freeing to just realize and go with the flow. But yeah, taking those moments out of the day to just connect with your readers or to read that message and sit with it is so nice because we don't always get to do that. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I mean, I think Speaking you're right. Of readers. <laughs> you know, what Stephen King said is sometimes, you know, that telepathy is going to pass right by people that aren't tuned into it. Or, you know, Diana Gabaldon said, you know, the magic is not going to strike everyone. And it's you not. don't, that's what we don't have control over. Right. You know, we only have control over the things we have control over. And, you know, um, I don't know. It's just something I think that I think there are I think for for everyone, there's a lot more positive that comes out of our work than negative. And 
I, I just, I don't dwell on the negative anymore. It's, it's not, it's just not worth it. Well, the book is like a perfume. It's not for everybody. Yeah. You know, yeah. what this is good for you is not good for everybody. You know, and I, and I even think that it, what I'm trying to do, I'm not saying I do this a hundred percent, but what I'm, the mind frame I'm trying to have is you write a thing and it is for you what it is, right? The book I wrote mattered to me in those ways. I put themes, emotions, things happening in my life in that book. But the second someone else reads it, it is not yours. It is not your life, your perspective, your anything. And as much as I can let it go and think a person is reading this and they're putting their whole experience in this. This has nothing to do with you, right? And that's the gift is that you are handing something over to someone and they're going to have a completely different experience and maybe it's magic and maybe it's not but you're giving him that opportunity to connect with something in their own way to me that's so powerful and it, i mean that's magic sure. well when we you and i vanessa discussed little voices i made you realize things about your book that you didn't even realize oh absolutely well, the way i read it through my eyes you know so that's interesting <laughs> you made me cry honey. <laughs> <laughs> but i'm just saying because i had my own baggage mm -hmm. so to speak that i took into it you were like oh my god i didn't think of that so yeah that was emotion that was an emotional interview but well, yeah beautiful. but that's like but that's what you want you yeah you put it out there and if someone connects in that way like that's the best feeling and just think it's a thriller and we were crying during our interview <laughs> I know. <It's> so <laughs> so. Well, speaking of thrillers i do want you vanessa to have a chance to tell us about your newest that just launched yesterday so that's exciting happy yeah. belated birthday so tell us about the best congratulations thank you yeah so um uh for the best is my second thriller it's about a woman who um, has a seemingly perfect life. She's a CEO of a nonprofit and she definitely has the perfect house, the perfect husband, the perfect kid, but she has a drinking problem. And one night she goes out, gets blackout drunk. The next day she wakes up hungover, trying to remember what she did. And there's a police officer at her door with her wallet and, and an evidence bag. And she is the only suspect in a terrible murder. And so she starts a true crime blog to prove herself innocent because she is the only suspect. And so for me, this book was personally an exploration of my own kind of female white privilege and things I take for granted, um, things I've been given that I haven't appreciated and exploring what I imagine should be for the best, the things I expect to happen to me, only because I live in a world that allows for me to do that. And so that, while to me it was exploring those issues, my number one priority in this book was to make it a page turner. My dream was for someone, and I've had people say this to me, which is I read it in one sitting. Like that's what I wanted more than anything is, um, you know, to be able, oh, thank you so much, Erica, that's so nice. Um, to be able to, and the kind of cool thing about it to me is I put in it interspersed vlog chapter. So that's like a video blog, almost like script pages. Oh, I love that. Really fun to do. So you get the first perspective of Jules trying to prove herself innocent of murder. And then you get her vlog chapters where you get a little more perspective on maybe who she is and what, what has happened in her life. Um, so it was so great to write. I needed to write it personally. Like it was a place I needed to go. And I actually had a, a lot of fun with it. And um, so far it seems like people are really enjoying it, which is great. That's great. Congrats. Yeah, congratulations. Congrats. Serena loved it. I haven't finished it, but Serena loved it from the right review. Yes. Oh, she's so great. Thank you. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. You know, it's such a, it's a hard time to launch a book. Like you just, it's just crazy. It's like, you don't want to ask too much of people because God knows what they've got going on, but also, you know, you put your heart and soul in something. So you want people to read it. It's just, you know, every time someone tells me they liked it or they're having a good experience with it, I just feel so grateful because 
We just don't know. Yeah, she wa she won't discuss the very ending with me, and I'm like, you gotta you know, get. Yeah. I know, I know, I know, but. Uh, <laughs> I can't read as fast as I used to, but yeah, I'm so excited because it's just, it, it will be there when you're ready. I know. Your books are just always awesome. So, <laughs> so excited to have it out in the world finally. It felt like forever. Not going to lie. I've been talking about it forever. <laughs> That's what it is. Doing weird thing. You just talk and talk, and I don't know. It's so, it is. It's so weird, but great. Well, congratulations. Thank you. What about you, Robert? What's your upcoming book about? So the last uh, <laughs> last agent is the uh, is the second book in the Charles Jenkins series. And uh, in The Eighth Sister, um, Charlie finds himself for reasons that uh, I won't don't need to get into. He finds himself in Russia and he's um, he's basically looking for something. Everything he's been told. Uh, former CIA oh officer, he gets sent back into Russia, and everything he's been told is a lie. Mm. And basically, what he ends up is he's running for his life, and uh, he makes it home. And it's a, it's a you know it's one of those fun books. It's an espionage book, so it's a chase book, mm -hmm. and it's one of those fun books where I got to speak to experts on scuba diving and all kinds of things, and uh, you you know brought in a lot of my own travels uh, when I spent time in Moscow and in Turkey and in all over and. You know, I get to throw that all in there and he finally gets home and um, the book does really, really well. And Gracie and I speak and she says, you know, I, I think it would make a great series. So, you know, the next book is, you know, um, the last agent is he goes back into Russia and he um, he goes back in for a very solid reason. Uh, mm -hmm. The woman who's responsible for him being alive. He finds out may be alive and may be being held in Lefertovo prison, which is a really is really Russia's bad, bad prison. And so he needs to go back into Russia. But this time he's not going in incognito. He he needs to uh, basically uh, expose himself and uh, so that he can make contact with the man who chased him and nearly killed him in the first book. A guy named Viktor Fedorov, who's one of my favorite characters, uh, former FSB officer. And um, he needs to get in touch with Victor because he needs to find out if this woman is still alive and where she is. So uh, it was a heck of a lot of fun to write. Um, I had a great time doing it. I got a chance to speak to a lot of experts doing a lot of different, you know, really cool things, flying bush planes and, you know, driving uh, um, uh, snowmobiles, uh, you know, in really d dangerous locations and <laughs> <laughs> things like that. So, I mean, I had a, I had a lot of fun writing it and um, the early reviews have been really good. And so fingers crossed it comes out in about a week, two weeks, I think on the 22nd. And, um, you know, it was one of the, one of the most funs I've had writing a novel because you really can just, you can just kind of let, let it go. And um, it was fun. Can you tell everybody about meeting, haven't your meeting with the CIA agent for the first time? Yeah. So, um, so I, I said that I, I hadn't really thought about writing this book, but I had gotten an, uh, an uh, email from a, a gentleman who, um, who said he had read my book, The Jury Master, and he'd like to talk to me about it. And I'm sure all of you have gotten emails like that, and your initial reaction is to run for the hills and not look back, <laughs> uh, which is kind of what I did. And about two days later, he said he'd read my second novel. And boy, he'd really like to talk to me about the character Charles Jenkins. And then he, you know, I kind of didn't respond. And then, you know, like on the third or fourth day, he had read like every David Sloan book and he wanted to talk about Charles Jenkins. So um, I looked him up and it turned out that he was, you know, a legitimate, you know, businessman uh, close by to where I lived. And uh, I felt c comfortable at least going and meeting him, you know, at a public coffee place. And, uh, and I did. And just before I left, just before I left the house, I decided I'd Google him one more time. And when I Googled him, I got I got a similar name, but slightly different mm. about a former intelligence officer who was acquitted of espionage. And he is the only intelligence officer acquitted of espionage. Um, and so sure enough, when I went to talk with him, um, he said uh, he started to talk to me and I said, 
are you aware that there's a guy out there that has a name very similar to yours that was accused of espionage and, and acquitted? And he said, that was me. <laughs> so he, uh, he, 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 you know, I said, well, tell me your story. And he did. And, you know, it was one of those stories that was really very interesting, but it wasn't timely. You know, it took place in a country that really wasn't very sexy. Um, you know, there just wasn't a lot there. And so, you know, in talking to him, I said, you know, he didn't want me to write his story. He just kind of wanted to tell me about what he had done, et cetera. I said, you know, it is very fascinating. The framework would be very fascinating for a book. Um, I'm thinking I, that it would be very interesting to set it in Russia because Russia is, you know, really sexy right now. Being with Putin and everything. Um, you know, would you help me with some of the espionage? And he said he would. And wow. it, what was really funny about it was um, I ended up speaking to two other individuals, met them totally randomly, who also had been CIA officers. <laughs> and I said, would you be willing to help me? And um, they're really interesting guys, because if you saw them on the street, they're just ordinary they're just ordinary guys. You would never pick them out of a crowd. They're not James Bond. You know, they're not Jason Bourne. Uh, they're the opposite. They could blend into any crowd. Um, and, and that's really what I learned most from them. And that's really Charles Jenkins' biggest problem is he doesn't blend in. He's a six foot five African-American in Russia, which has about a 4% black population. So he stands out. Uh, and that was one of the things we talked about when um, I sold the, the movie rights, the television rights. Mm -hmm. We talked about who could play him in that role because um, there wasn't a lot of actors who are 60 years old, African-American, and, you know, have all that, all those abilities and everything. So it was, it, was, um, it was really a lot of fun meeting these individuals and talking to them because of how understated they all were. Um, and yet you got a sense that they were very, very capable men. That's so cool. Capable of a lot of things. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> That's amazing. That, what a, and the odd, what are the odds that you would stumble across exactly this, the right people that you needed? I mean, that's, that goes back to that, that magic that just happens when it's the right story to tell. Those things tend to fall into place. Yeah, I um, agree right. to... I got invited to a, I'll make this short and quick, but I got invited to speak at um, the library for the blind. And as I was speaking to them, the woman who invited me, she said, can I introduce you to my father? He's a big fan. Well, of course. I mean, how, how often does that happen? You know, not very often. Right. And so he came up and I started talking to him and he said, what are you working on? And I started telling him the plot for the eighth sister. And he got kind of this funny look on his face. And I said, um, what, why are you looking at me that way? And he said, well, I spent, a lot of time in Russia in 1972 and my office was in the Metropol Hotel, which is where Jenkins spends a lot of his time. Wow. And I said, in 1972, he said, yeah, I was working for American Express. And I looked at him and I said, and every time you came back from Russia, did you have to get debriefed by the State Department? And he started laughing and he said, yeah. Oh. And I, said, I said, so you were a CIA officer? And he said, no. He said, I was, I, I was working for the Australian Secret Service. And I said, oh. I, didn't, I didn't know Australia had a Secret Service. And he said, neither did they. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, again, it was just really fortuitous that I had the chance to meet this man. And I sat down with him and said, you know, can we talk? And he said, as long as you don't use my name or anything else about me, I'm happy to talk to you. Wow. That is amazing. Well, speaking of the Library of the uh, for the Blind, Freya, <laughs> you did some interesting research um, for your book. Some sensory deprivation, I hear. I did. I, first of all, I I've always had a, like a fear of going blind. I have terrible eyes, just so it, it's always been kind of one of those things in the back of my head. But I live five minutes from the Tennessee School for the Blind. So I started there and I went and talked to their director and he was so nice. He sat me down and just talked about all the gadgets they use and the software. And we talked about parenting and how mothers, you know, tend to pull their strollers instead of push them and how they identify their children and just, just like little things that you wouldn't necessarily 
think about. And then when I decided to set this book in Elmhurst, Illinois, um, due to, it's, it's just very easy to navigate. So we had friends that lived there and my husband and I went there and I like blindfolded myself and just walked the streets. Um, and I mean, with him helping, but it's just amazing um, how vulnerable that was. And I didn't even have my daughter with me, but just, you know, again, taking away the sight, I think our, our, we always think that our other senses are heightened and that's not actually true. You just learn to use them in a different way. And I realized I had to make my character nearly blind. I couldn't completely make her blind from birth. Otherwise we wouldn't have a story to tell or a world to build, but it was super fascinating <laughs> to, to research. But when I sat down to write it, I was like, what have I done? Like I've, I've taken away sight. Like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna explain anything? And it was, it was really challenging to try to build a world um, from her perspective, but I also thought it was really cool to showcase a protagonist with a, you know, quote unquote disability. Um, mm -hmm. with all of the vision impaired people I talk to don't really see it. Um, they don't see themselves any differently. You know, crimes are handled differently. Um, I remember hearing one horror story about someone who ordered an Uber and got into it and it was not an Uber and they were assaulted and mm -hmm you know, no way to identify that person. So things like that, we just don't think about, um, even how to cross the street and just just really amazing. Just, I just got such amazing insight from that community. And it was, it was very, very grateful that they were so open and willing to talk about it. You yeah. don't really think about the difference in how they have to handle crimes. Um, my brother, is a um, cold case detective here in Nashville. Um, Ooh, Rhea wow. and I are actually just on opposite ends of, of town. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's He works uh, for Metro as a cold case detective and um, he, he doesn't bring his work home. We don't hear about much of what he's doing um, other than, you know, there, there are a lot of unpleasant things about his job, um, but he was homicide for a while and now he's cold case and gets pulled out on a lot of homicide too. And, you know, and, and just thinking about what he has to do all the time as an investigator and, and how that must make their job so much more difficult and yet so much more heartbreaking all at the same time, knowing they desperately want to help these people and yet have so little to go on because we do tend to, you know, like you said, I mean, when you take away sight, what is what's left? How do you describe something um, without that visual? And I can only imagine, you know, if he's having to investigate this, particular crime. I, I'm looking at it from his side of things, thinking it, that's got to make those detectives working on that just feel almost helpless and yet heartbroken at the same time for the victims, because there's so much that they could do to help them that they have to work without in that Definitely. particular case. And when I was building this, you know, this mother thinks that her baby has been swapped, which is just like a, a crazy notion in and of itself. But I talked to a a cop here in Nashville and he really talked to me about the way that that would be handled and that it kind of, you know, unless there was specific evidence, it's not really going to be taken that seriously. And we kind of went through every single scenario and yeah, it was, it was super tragic that, that that's how it's sometimes handled, but, uh, but it is important. Yeah. It is. Now, Vanessa, you had some interesting um, kind of walking around and taking pictures and, and back alleys that are important to you. Um, I love some of the stories that you were telling about how you were, were reinventing some familiar places um, as part of your research for and development for your stories. Tell us about that. So my story is set in Providence, Rhode Island in the neighborhood I live in. And I really, in the so by the time I was published with Little Voices, I had been trying to be published for almost 13 years. And in those previous books, you know, they were set in other places that I didn't, I think, have a heartbeat in. And so when I wrote Little Voices and also for the best, they are set right where I live. And I think especially for a debut writer, that's really important for me anyway, to be able to just have that um, connection and you can just easily explain it and instantly connect to it. And so I love setting my books where I live because I like to walk around where the settings are. As I mean, as Ray was saying, like it's powerful, you know, to be in a place and have almost the experience of your character and to be able to mm -hmm. pull things that you 
wouldn't have been able to guess at otherwise. I mean, it's just impossible. So, you know, the alleyway where the murder happens is just actually down the road from where I live. The house that's a prominent part of the story is not too far. And I sort of walked around picking it out based on, you know, different things I knew about the story. And then you can just set scenes and places that are just fascinating too. Like a big scene happens on Brown University's campus in, you know, Providence. So I love being able to really explore the places that are just close to me. And, oh, thank you so much, Sharon. Yeah, it was really fun. Today I was on um, a novel beat sharing some of that. And I, not, I just hadn't had that experience before until I started writing just really literally about where I'm from and walking around and thinking about the story itself and what would be interesting as a setting. Um, so that was a blast to do. That's how I feel about New Orleans. I always feel like there is a heartbeat there for me. You know, it's it's got soul for me. I yeah. mean, that's I grew up down there. And so when a place has soul, it's so much easier to to pour that onto the page for readers to really kind of dive into with you and the place comes alive. I always say that you know for me in my my writing, New Orleans becomes as much a character as everybody else in the story and it has to live and breathe just as much as, as they do to oh, really did. pull the reader it in. Did. It did. <laughs> Thanks, it Andy. Did. <laughs> I feel like I was there. I visited. I want to be buried there. I want my funeral there. You know, it's, it's yeah. You definitely did. I, I I actually have said that you know I want to be buried. I want to be cremated, and I want my ashes to be spread in Lafayette Cemetery, which is where the the tombs the tombs that are on the covers of my my Crescent City series are all Lafayette Cemetery. Uh, they're photos that I took of Lafayette Cemetery, and so I love that place. And so I want my ashes buried there, scattered there. But I want some of them scattered on the Washington Street streetcar stop because I want to be among the living and the dead of New Orleans. And so there's there's always that's the stop where you get off to go tour the cemetery to walk to the cemetery. So it's like the streetcars go by and they're so full of life and the people coming and going and the hustle and bustle of the city. But then at the same time, that's where you go to go visit the souls in Lafayette Cemetery. So that's kind of. You know, it's, so the city itself just has that pull for me because I, I feel like there's, it, it, it truly lives and breathes. I, I don't ever think about New Orleans as a stagnant thing. And I think when a place is really important to you, it's easier to convey that to your readers and, and bring it to life. And, and it makes a much richer story well, dissolve into the book. Well, after I read Vanessa's book, Little voices. I had to go to Newport, y'all. <laughs> it's real. Like, I could do it. It was closed, so I went to Newport because of her book. Awesome. So yeah. So and amazing. and it's beautiful. That's really pretty. Yeah. I love and, New England. My son went to school up in Connecticut. New New England is gorgeous. Uh, Kirsten, I'm I'm actually from South Louisiana, but I do live in New in Nashville. So yes, I've got my my New Orleans and, and Nashville stuff going on behind me. So yes, those I had those custom done because they are important to me. They're really pretty. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. And Dorothy is from South Louisiana. Hey girl. South I'm sorry, Kirsten, and, um, like a, sorry, Kirsten who just left um a comment. She's an yeah. author. Uh she just released a book. Uh she's releasing a book on the fifteenth. So oh, oh, well, another thriller you. author. Nice, Kirsten. Congratulations. Great. So since I have thriller authors here, uh, one of the things we always do, I always do a New Orleans history and mystery segment uh, where history lives and breathes because New Orleans absolutely does. But one of the things that I thought we would talk about today as thriller <laughs> authors are weird Louisiana laws. <laughs> this is so funny. Okay. <laughs> So some weird Louisiana laws. Imagine, if you will, that these became the plot of a thriller. Um, in Louisiana, and these are laws still on the books, y'all. It is illegal to gargle in public places. I like that, I like that law. I'm down with that one. Like, that's yeah. gross. Don't do that. Yeah. Where I can yeah. see. Um, here's one. 
I like some of these laws are conditional. Like this is illegal unless, and here's an unless. Snoring is prohibited unless all bedroom windows are closed and securely locked. Oh my God. Because wow. the window is gonna make a difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a true snoring problem. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's throwing the windows open and everything. Like talk about so rattling the windows when they're <laughs> snoring. <laughs> okay, then you have to think about the situations that must have caused some of these laws to go into effect. Okay, right. <laughs> Mourners at a wake may not eat more than three sandwiches. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh my God. The one that themselves at a wake and something had to be done. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, let's work on the nuances of this one, okay? <laughs> taxi drivers are prohibited from making love in the front seat of their taxi during their shifts. Oh my God. on duty or when you're off. It's like these <laughs> conditional <laughs> laws here. And clearly in South Louisiana, you must have laws that involve the wildlife. It's South Louisiana. Snakes are not allowed within 200 yards of the Mardi Gras parade route. Snakes? Snakes. Snakes. Keep them out. They cannot be within 200 yards of the Mardi Gras parade route. Make sure they know where the route is. Oh, my God. I love this one. Again, think of the situation that must have come from this. I mean, some, some situation caused this law to go in effect. You may not tie an alligator to a fire hydrant. <laughs> oh, I love it. And similarly, you cannot steal someone else's alligator. This particular offense carries a 10 year jail term. <laughs> That's oh, 10 man. years if you steal someone else's alligator. <laughs> In Johnson City, all garbage must be cooked before it is fed to a hog. <laughs> no wrong. Take, no I mean, wrong. in Louisiana, we take our food and apparently our slop very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot oh. pursue a fish in a city park. What? <laughs> Does that mean like fishing or something else? Well, it is part of the no fishing law. So you can, wow. but you cannot pursue, pursue is the word that they used in the actual oh, no. law. You cannot pursue. Now, if you come, if you look this one up, you're going to say you cannot chase a fish. <laughs> like that's, the, that's the layman's version of that law. But the actual law, if you look it up, it actually says pursue a fish in a city park. Mm. Um, again, situation led to this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great two-parter. It is illegal to rob a bank and then shoot at the bank teller with a water pistol. <laughs> <laughs> you had to shoot him in the face with a real gun. <laughs> yeah, with a real gun. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They didn't stop at it is illegal to rob a bank. Right, but and then <laughs> shoot the teller wow. with a water pistol. <laughs> Can't do that. Don't do that. Now, outdated, but still on the books. Goatees are illegal unless you first pay a special license fee for the privilege of wearing one in public. Oh, oh no, goatees without a permit. Oh, no public wow. goatees without a permit. Those are <laughs> <laughs> I love this one. This is the last one we'll talk about, and we got to go out with a bang here. So, again, outdated, but still on the books. Can you imagine this? It is illegal for a woman in New Orleans to drive a car unless her husband is waving a flag in front of it. Wow. So that is our foray into weird. That's amazing. That's awesome. Thank you, Nola.
Yeah. I mean, I that's, 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 laws that's, ever. that's crazy. <laughs> Every state has got some, and when you start to kind of look them up, there are a lot of fun, but I want to dig them up, Louisiana. I know we got to dig into some, some tennis. Uh, yeah, there's, 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 um, so Nola, I, uh, I was a lawyer and, uh, I worked, uh, in, it worked, I was in, uh, the Sacramento, um, federal court and I was up against a guy whose nickname was Mil Maximum Milt. Milton Schwartz, and his name was Maximum Milt because he always gave people the maximum sentence. And I got up to argue uh, a motion, and um, I was arguing against uh, a, a woman, female lawyer, and she was very young and very new, and she had no case law on her side, so all she cited was Louisiana case law. And you learn, you learn as a lawyer that you don't cite Louisiana case law <laughs> and I, I kid you not, the judge said to her, if I was to grant your motion, the appellate court would not only have it back on my desk by the time I walked back there, they would have me certified and put in an insane asylum. <laughs> I love it. So I can tell you, Louisiana has got some crazy laws on the, and just things that are actually totally accepted as normal in Louisiana is enough. But then you add the legal side of it, and all of the things that must have happened for those laws to be on the books. I mean, this is the state where the governor was told he could not build a football stadium at LSU, that they would not pay for that. And so he, they said, he said, well, what would you pay for? And he said, they told him, well, we'll pay for dorms because you need dorms at LSU. And he said, all right, give me the money for the dorms. So he built them in the shape of a football stadium. <laughs> <laughs> and that, my friends, is how Death Valley came to be. And you know, so Tiger Stadium actually does, it, it's used as offices and storage room now, but it was the athletic dorms. Because uh, the governor got money for dorms, and then once you build it in that shape, what are you gonna do? You might as well. <laughs> <start it. laughs> and so, you know, they can find a backwards way to get anything they want, and you know, yeah. come hell or high water, come in all of America, legal or not, to come to me. In yeah. all of America, so all it, of it is a it is a strange place. Louisiana is now. Speaking of strange things, we are going to get into Louisiana land. Yep. Louisiana lanyap. Lanyap in Louisiana means a little something extra. So it is like the 13th donut in a baker's dozen, just something extra. And so here's something just for fun. So authors, let's debate. Pumpkin spice. Love it or leave it? What do you think? I'm going to leave it. I love it for fall. Like, I can do it for fall. <laughs> fall, winter. Oh, yeah, I love it. I, I, and I'll do it cold, cold or hot. Iced or not. All the way. I'm going never, no how, no way, no place. <laughs> Strong word. I love it. I, I like it in a candle. Yeah, I will drink it. it. No, yeah. I love. Yeah, I love. I love coffee any way I can get it, y'all. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Why? I mean, in the morning. Robert says so like coffee. Oh, yes. It's like a pumpkin spice caramel foam. I mean, no, you're no, no, the, it's it oh, can't be. Like, it can't be super duper. Sweet. I'm not like that because I'm like be sweet. I'm gonna send you a coffee order. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it Here's a kit at Starbucks. <laughs> I don't do I, that. I, it's good. I don't drink my pumpkin spice. Like like I said, candle. Yeah. I can do. I like the yeah. fragrance. It smells good when other people order pumpkin spice. Um, I I can't drink it. Like give me pumpkin bread. Yeah. Give me like right now. I got a whole thing from Kroger over here that is their soft top pumpkin chocolate chip cookies that are like the top of a, like a muffin top, but they're a cookie. Um, oh, I will eat me awesome. some of those things, okay. that, and I don't need a whole box of them in my house. I really don't. I need to find some people to give them to because I will make a mess of these. But I can't drink it. I mean, it's like I just can't put it in my coffee. Coffee is like I, I love. I wake up and live for my coffee. I think about my morning coffee. As I'm getting ready for bed, no. like this is how <laughs> you have your afternoon coffee. I tried oh, to quit. It was I my, that. it was like the worst three days ever. <laughs> it's just yeah, I love it, love it. I, I gotta have my coffee. I, I gotta have it, but I can't put pumpkin spice in it. Like that's just it's just not gonna happen for me. I, I You're not. curious. It's okay. 
Well, I gotta put stuff in it. Like I'm, not, I, I would love to say that I'm a purist. My grandparents, and I don't know if this is a Louisiana thing or not. Y'all tell me. I mean, Louisiana is weird. My grandparents, when I was little bitty, my grandfather was a deacon in the church. My grandmother was my Sunday school teacher, and I would spend Saturday nights with them. Sunday mornings, they would wake me up and I would go crawl in their bed and my grandfather would come down the hallway with a little tray and I would hear the clinking of coffee of coffee cups, the little porcelain coffee cups. And he would have a cup of coffee for him and a cup of coffee for my grandmother and coffee. The other thing, y'all tell me in the comments because I, I don't really know. This is what I grew up on. Coffee milk, was mostly milk and sugar and a splash of coffee. So I'm like three. And I'm sitting here. <laughs> like, we're going to church. I'm like the so be in my grandmother's Sunday school class. Like she's writing out the offering check. I got to lick the envelope. Like this is my Sunday morning. But three years old, I mean, and they would send me, you know, he would send my little cup down and my grandmother would hand it down to me. I'm sitting over there and he'd come get on the other side of the bed and we'd sit there and have our coffee milk in bed is what he called it. We always had coffee milk in bed every Sunday morning. I don't know why they did that. And then, you know, I get a little older. My brother starts coming. He's two and a half years younger than me. And he would I'd sit between my grandparents because that was my spot. I'm big sister. I've had that spot for years, little brother. And he'd sit at the foot of bed and he'd face us and our feet would touch. And we would have our coffee milk in the bed. I'm like, who in the world <laughs> does this? But so I grew up on coffee like that and so it kind of grew a little stronger and a little stronger as i got on say there's whiskey in it so i mean yeah <laughs> that. but you give it a three-year-old coffee i mean it was a little bit of coffee but i mean i'm three years old i'm like running laps around the church i don't know, if you know but <laughs> I mean, coffee in bed is awesome though to be fair to your grandparents like sitting in bed maybe they have the paper going that's oh yeah exactly. that's I, I remember that coffee if they just leave me alone for 30 minutes to have my coffee and read a paper. That'd be pretty great. Wow. <laughs> it was a ritual for us. And, and I, I love Louisiana for that, too. I mean, we there, so many things are kind of ritualized in Louisiana. I mean, everything from the crawfish boil and, you know, how that's that's all done to, you know, the Mardi Gras celebration. So even little things we tend to ritualize, like Sunday mornings. It was our that was our routine every Sunday morning. Then after coffee, milk in the bed, she would take me into my bedroom, had hair I could sit on. And she I was always wadded up at night. And then she'd tell me, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. And she'd brush that long hair and get me ready for church. But it's so ritualistic mm -hmm. that I think they looked forward to that. And it was kind of their way of getting us kind of ready for church. And it was it was almost just setting the scene for, you know, this is what we're going to do next. And it was a routine. We didn't argue with the routine. We knew this is what was going to happen and we were going to go to church and we were going to do our Sunday thing. So I guess it kind of just kind of got us into the rhythm of Sunday morning, but it is something that, you know, over 40 years later, I still it's remember so talking about with my grandparents and, you know, so I don't know. I don't think that that has anything to do with me not wanting pumpkin spice in my coffee. <laughs> No, I love that story. That's a great story. Oh, there you are. Oh. Is she there? I think I. she's frozen. She's frozen. Now I really want coffee and it's like... Well, me, me too. I, I, met my, I met my husband at a coffee truck. We used to work oh, this. There, you're back. That's nice. All right. Oh, there you go. You have to occasion thing. I know. I was thinking you were going to talk about chicory coffee because that's what I always have when I'm in. Do you right? like? I like chicory coffee too. I absolutely do. And, but it's one of those things that's too strong to drink every day, like all the time. I mean, like, New Orleanians, there's some diehards that will drink that chicory coffee. But and now, when you go to like the coffee and beignet places, they have chicory coffee. Like that's oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so good. good. So good. Oh, Deborah loves your hair, by the way. Um, and I love the total non sequitur. That I love that phrase. Oh, she's great. She's another great author. She has a book coming out in September. Yeah. September. September books are falling. And Nola has a book coming out in October. I do. Thank you. Deborah, we need you on the show. Yes. We need to get Deborah on the show. We need to get um, all of our friends. Everybody just message me. We'll 
add more shows. I keep adding shows. Oh, that's that's a good point. Point. I love that cover. Deborah, it's so beautiful. I love that. I'm so it excited. is. It looks great. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Deborah, send me a message. Let's let's get you on the show too. Let's do this. Um, yeah, this was supposed to be a, a twice a month show and it's gone to every week. <laughs> so I'm having such a blast getting authors out and being able to get them in front of people because I know that that's a lot harder to do these days. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun to get everybody on and just chat about things that are not necessarily kind of the same old thing. So it's always a lot of fun to do that. Um, next week coming up, um, Annie, are you jo you're joining me again, right? For next week's show? We've got yeah, we got Kimberly Bell, Hank Philippi Ryan, Hannah Mary McKinnon, and JT Ellison. Oh that's, our that's, so good. <laughs> that's so good. Yes, so you guys have got to come and check that show out. It's gonna be a heck of a lot of fun. Um, little tease for that one. JT Ellison and I have something very special cooked up for the New Orleans History and Mystery segment. Um, she's gonna tell you a ghost story, and I'm gonna tell you the truth. You get to decide which one's creepier. <laughs> so it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, I'm let JT tell that story because it's awesome. Um, so always, always coming up with different things that we can do. And you guys are awesome hanging out with me, spending this evening with me. I know you've got so many other things that you can do, but I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And I do want to, um, Put the books up so folks please support your authors that have taken some time to join us tonight make sure that you are grabbing their books and they all have many 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 books but here we go with some of these we've got um robert's book that is coming out on the 22nd vanessa's that just launched and Rhea, i know you've got several out as well so guys please check them out support them as they have spent some time with us this evening. So let's pay it forward to these guys and check it out. And yes, um, Crescent City Send, the sequel to Crescent City Moon is coming out October, 2020. So if you have not read Crescent City Moon yet, um, you'll wanna go grab that one. Crescent City Send gets even darker, even grittier. And we explore a little bit of the underbelly of old New Orleans and Crescent City Send. So join me for a trip through Gallatin Street, which is not Gallatin, Tennessee. <laughs> not Gallatin, Tennessee. Right? Um, but Gallatin Street is no longer there in New Orleans, but it was pretty much the dregs of the city for a while. And in the dregs of the city, um, dregs of people. And so some interesting characters pop up there. And that was a lot of fun to write for me. So make sure you've checked out Crescent City Moon because Crescent City Sin does pick up exactly where Crescent City Moon left off. So you do need to read one before you get to the other. So guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all of our, our commenters. And I know um, I will be popping back into the comments, guys, to answer some of these things. Hopefully our authors will check those out as well. Um, make sure that you are subscribed to Nolan Ash Entertainment on YouTube. This is where we house all of the past episodes of the Second Line Show. So you can go back and check out this show. I'll hopefully have it up for you tomorrow. It's got to process overnight. And then um, you can always check it out there. So revisit any of our conversation. And it's a lot of fun. And the first episodes are also posted there too. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thanks, everybody. Really Thanks for spending the day with us. And guys, we will see you soon on the second live show.